Hello again, flight simmers. We're back in the Miltech MH60 to get to grips with how the autopilot works. Now, in my recent first impressions video for the Miltech MH60, I commented about not being able to figure out how to use the auto hover. Well, I now think I've got it worked out and a whole lot more about what the autopilot can and also, quite importantly, can't do. A lot of this came through trial and error and the occasional crash but also, quite importantly, I found the documentation, which is well worth a read, so I'll put a link in the description. So, to kick things off, let's take a closer look at the AFCS control panel and see what all those buttons and knobs do. Starting from the top left, we have SAS1 and SAS2. SAS stands for Stability Augmentation System and is essentially a computer that stabilizes the aircraft and reduces the pilot's workload. Both should be turned on the whole time during normal flight, as one acts as a backup for the other. Should both fail, then it would be considered an emergency, and you are recommended to land immediately. Next we have the trim button. This turns the automatic force trim system on and off. This continue adjusts the trim of the aircraft, so that if you release the stick, the aircraft should retain the last command attitude. So if you are straight and level, you should stay straight and level. If you're climbing, you should continue climbing, and so on. There are some advanced options for managing force trim, but they only really apply to those with speciality cyclic controls that are set up for it. But if you're using a regular sprung joystick, you probably want to have this turned on. Next we have the autopilot master button. As you may imagine, this turns the autopilot on and off. It's not needed for SAS or the trim, but it is needed for the other autopilot functions, which we'll cover next. The radar altitude button will maintain your current altitude above the terrain up to a maximum of 5,000 feet. Just be mindful that it also responds to buildings and vegetation, so rough terrain and heavily populated areas could get bumpy. Barometric altitude hold will maintain your current barometric altitude. This is great for long-range cruising, just keep an eye out for rising terrain, it won't automatic over mountains in the way that radar altitude hold will. Approach slash hover will do different things depending on your airspeed. If your airspeed is above 50 knots, it will activate the approach mode, where it will decelerate to 50 knots and descend to 200 feet, at which point it will automatically switch to hover mode. Once in hover mode, the aircraft will slow and descend to the speed and AGR altitude set on the two velocity knobs and the hover altitude knob. These knobs are pretty self-explanatory and useful for taxiing or getting yourself into position to use the hoist or other equipment that might distract you from the actual flying of the helicopter. Crew hover allows the hover to be controlled from the cabin using key binds. The final button we're going to look at is the Depart button. This can be used to depart from a hover back into cruise. It's kind of like the go-around button on an aeroplane. The remaining buttons are marked inoperative and will just take care of themselves. So, let's see these buttons in action with an actual mission. This is a search and rescue mission to recover the crew of a sinking yacht. The helicopter is ready to go, so let's get airborne. You can't engage the master autopilot while on the ground, so we need to take off first. You also can't adjust the speed or altitude while you have the altitude hold engaged, so we must first get up to a suitable speed and altitude before we engage the autopilot. It also means, if you want to make any adjustments during the flight, you must disable the autopilot make your adjustment and then re-engage it. Lastly, the autopilot won't automatically follow your flight plan. There's no LNAV option here. Course adjustments must be made by the pilot, but can be done so with the pedals and stick without having to disengage the autopilot. So, let's see these buttons in action with an actual mission. Now at a reasonable cruising speed and altitude, let's engage the barometric hold. This is done by turning on the master autopilot switch and then pressing bar out. At this point I can completely release the controls 
and just make small adjustments with the pedals and stick to keep me on course. The stability of the autopilot means if you're the impatient sort, you can speed up the sim rate, but only to the first level. If you go beyond that, things get quite unstable quite quickly. As we're below 5,000 feet, we could use a radar altitude hold instead of barometric hold if we wanted. Over water this is nice and smooth, as water tends to be relatively flat. But up ahead is land, and although it's fairly flat, it should have enough buildings and vegetation to demonstrate how things could get a bit bumpy. As you can see, the aircraft starts to bounce a little as it tries to account for the changing terrain underneath it. This is terrible, it's not the smoothest experience, and on rougher terrain in VR could possibly become a little nauseating. With that in mind, I'm going to switch back to barometric hold for now. It takes a few seconds to stabilise itself, but the aircraft soon returns to a nice smooth flight. We're now approaching our target, so I need to prepare for the next stage of the mission. The first thing I want to do is set my hover altitude so it's ready for when I make my approach. I'm also going to turn on the searchlight because that feels like the thing to do when you're doing a search and rescue mission at night. The approach mode can overshoot the descent from time to time, so pick a level above where you want to be, then descend further once you're in a stable hover. You can see the smoke from the yacht up ahead now. Time to engage the approach mode. If you've increased the sim rate, this is the time to return it to normal. You'll see on the primary display that I immediately start to slow down and reduce altitude. This is all the autopilot at this point. As it looks like I'm a bit wide and going to overshoot, I can use a stick and pedals to circle round the target but the descent and acceleration are being managed by the autopilot. We've settled into a hover, but I'm way too far away from the boat to use the winch. This is where our velocity knobs come into play. I can use the longitudinal velocity to move me forward. Just a word of caution though, sometimes when you return the knob to zero it can take a little longer than expected to stop, but you can expedite your deceleration with the cyclic. I've stopped off to the side so I can see the target out of the window. Now I can use my lateral velocity knob to edge me closer. OK, now in position, let's transfer hover control to the cabin and turn on the winch. Aft, then we can go control. back there and watch the action. Aft, I have hover control. Ignore me opening the comms page, I meant to open the camera page.
Now, it's not actually necessary to come back here for the mission, but it's kind of fun and adds to the immersion. Okay, now the survivors on board, it's back to base for hot cocoa and crumpets, or possibly something stronger. I can turn the searchlight off now, as we don't need that anymore. Once we're ready to set off, we can use the depart button to take us out of our hover and back into cruise. You'll see the helicopter pitch forward and hear the engine change as you start to climb and accelerate again. While it's doing that, I can turn to put us on the correct course. The depart button will only accelerate to 120 knots, so if you want to go faster, and I do, you'll need to disconnect the autopilot to speed up and then re-engage it after. However, disconnecting the autopilot does set off the warning alarm, which can be kind of annoying but probably important if the autopilot disengage unintentionally. Just hit the master warning button to acknowledge it. I'm going to use the approach mode again to bring us down onto the runway, hopefully. Honestly, I find it easier to land by hand, but for the purpose of this video, we'll use the autopilot. You'll notice the helicopter starts climbing again. I suspect this is because I was approaching fast and low and the helicopter was trying to slow down, which caused me to climb, but it should work itself out. And we settled into a hover on the runway. Admittedly not on the centre line, but it is at least on the runway. Now we can just use the velocity knobs to taxi to parking. Now you might be thinking, can I use a cyclic to manoeuvre an auto hover? It would seem this does work if you're already moving, however if you're in a static hover, the aircraft pitches and banks, but apparently this has no effect on the aircraft's position. 20 feet. 20 feet. This feels like a bug to me, but it may also be a necessary evil of the flight model. Also, landing from auto hover takes some practice. You might think you just need to set your hover altitude to zero, but that still holds you a couple of feet off the ground. You need to try to guess the correct feet. amount of collective, so that when you disengage the autopilot to land, you don't either balloon upwards or drop like a stone. But these are relatively minor points on what is otherwise a damn fine helicopter autopilot simulation. The only times I didn't have autopilot connected for this mission was takeoff, change it to speed and altitude whilst in cruise, and final touchdown at the end of the mission. The rest was all autopilot. Now I'm not suggesting that you should always use autopilot if you can, because for me at least, that would take a lot of the fun out of flying. But it's nice to have for those long stretches in cruise, or for holding a steady hover when using the winch or some of the other gizmos that are available with this module. I hope this has been helpful. If it has, please do the like and subscribe thing. Until next time, fly safe.